Hey guys, welcome to Human Factors Cast, episode 25. We got a great show for you today. I don't know if it's a great show. It should be a great show. I mean, I haven't heard it yet, but it should be good. Anyway, we got, uh, we're got. we going to cover some of the Human Factors news this week. Uh, we're going to address some listener feedback that you guys sent in, and we're going to play some Human Factors 20 questions. Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Billy Hall. Hey, everybody. And Blake Arnsdorf. What's going on? Uh, I'm good. Yeah? It's going on. You sure? Yes. Yeah? This is our second time of the new format. I almost started our old format. It's okay, though? Hey, it's, it's fine. It's, uh, uh, we're, good. we're learning. <laughs> we, okay? we okay, guys? We good this week? I'm good this week. I'm excited about the new Star Wars title that came out. The Last Jedi. But this is not yeah. a Star Wars show. We'll talk about that on the Star Wars one later. <laughs> all um, right, all right, all right. No, we had an interesting week. Uh, you, you know, last week we did our 2017 predictions, and a lot of them, strangely, are pretty <laughs> I, I don't know. They just listen to Human Factors cast and they're like, oh, yeah, these guys got it. No, a lot of them um, have been either coming true or, or are close to like, like, for example, this weekend, uh, Billy, one of your predictions was that social media was going to be a larger platform for people to sort of watch political protests and political events. Uh, I know I yeah. found myself watching the presidential inauguration as well as the Women's March. Um both days on YouTube. I just sat there and streamed them. I did the same thing because it was accessible and it was there when I needed it. So, yeah, I mean, you're you're just, you know. The power of the internet, for yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. And then, uh, Blake, some stuff. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly what your predictions were, but I'm, I'm sure there are some stuff. There's some stuff in there's, there. There's some stuff. Yeah, we get into a little <laughs> bit about autonomy in here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we talk about cars. But oh, yeah. A bit kind of coinciding with what you were talking about. The I mean, trolley problem. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that later. 100%. But uh, but anyway, are, are we good to move on to the first part of the show? The, yeah. Yes, let's do it. This is the first part of the show. This is all about our human factors news. Now, this could be anything from virtual reality, automation, psychology, design, anything, as long as it is within the field of human factors. Billy. What is up first? This week, LinkedIn revamped their website to be less confusing. The redesign aims to, in their words, provide the most relevant professional conversations, content, and opportunities, whether you're having a mobile app or on having a desktop experience. That's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a little I, bit. For sure, it's a, it, it it's a little bit at the end there on having a desktop experience. That's that's a little bit weird to say, but the point is there. They're 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 saying that they're they're. I mean, this is much needed. LinkedIn basically. I don't know. Have you guys have you guys checked this out yet? So I didn't, no, I I don't have a LinkedIn. You should get a LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> uh, Blake, you were gonna say something. Did, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I didn't. I had to update my profile picture today because we had to take pictures for it at work. Um, but I didn't notice really anything any easier or different about it. So they made it more like Facebook, uh, from what I understand. I haven't been on since their revamp. But, I mean, they needed to do this. It was pretty clunky. and uh, I mean, it's definitely clunky for sure. Yeah. But I didn't notice anything, so it's kind of a good seamless transition, whatever they've done. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a good good choice. Uh, everyone's talking about this. I think it's I think it's relevant. Um, we're always talking about user experience and and trying to make it good for the people who use it. And I mean, no one's going to use your linking. What is it? It's a it's a networking site if you can't effectively network. Which there's something to be said because there's so many people on it and so many connections to be made. Yeah, question about that, though. I sure. always thought LinkedIn was for, like, business people and, like, computer techs and things like that. But does it apply for anybody who wants to get into that stuff? Anybody. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it'll obviously go a little further with um, certain fields. And a lot of people use it uh, for, like you said, tech is pretty big with LinkedIn. 
Um, well, it's gotten really interesting over the past year or two for me because I'm. I mean, it, it is like a really nice online resume, but also people have been writing articles through it and posting blogs, and I don't know. I've learned a lot of stuff about growth and startups and stuff through LinkedIn. I've shared a couple episodes of Human Factors Cast on LinkedIn. Oh, who's the man? Oh man, yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah, so go check that out on LinkedIn. Uh, it's exciting stuff. Uh, definitely. <laughs> All right, Billy. Let's let's talk about some other stuff. What's up next? Okay, so scientists at MIT have created a 3D printing technique that allows you to change the polymers of an object after printing. This means you can grow or shrink an object, change its color, or even change a 3D printed shape completely. Now, with this article, it was weird for me because I'm understanding it as like, you know, redesigning an object. But is it redesigning an object or does it like... Take like say a bowling ball and and then shave it down to be a smaller bowling ball. Is that what they're talking about? Kind of. Uh, this is this is a really cool thing, especially for human factors, because if you uh, think about like if you would need something to be a moving part, I guess uh, the 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 benefit to this would be you can well the, obviously let's go into the the benefits of three D printing first, right? So the the benefits with the three D printing is that you don't need a specialized factory to make you a part, you can download the part and then literally send it to your printer and have the part a couple seconds later if you have the filament, uh, mm -hmm. which is just plastic. So with this, if you have the correct filament for this, what you can do is effectively 3D print something that will need to take a shape. Um, and I'm not sure um, what sort of technology they use, if this is like heat sensitive or what. So for what I was reading, I mean, it was a lot of the beginning stuff was on UV light and that was really okay. changing it. But they've, they've changed the chemical makeup of the polymer just to be the intensity of the light instead of it having to only be ultraviolet. Right. And oh, that's interesting. The, the picture they show is of a disc. Um, and you know, it's a white disc on the left and it's like, it's kind of like a hockey puck and then you expose a blue to it and then it changes color to be kind of like a, um, crash desk dummy sign on its side. Um, yeah, so I mean, but I mean, think about a, a a a piece of, I guess, plastic that would have to move. I'm thinking like prosthetics, personally, uh -huh. like where it will have to adjust to the way your skin moves, or or something along the lines. Like, let's say you have um, you have an arm amputated, and you have um. You, you know, you need that connection from the skin to the actual object, but it needs to mold. And mm -hmm. maybe maybe they could build in something that way. I as I'm reading this, I'm I'm looking here to see if they have any applications. I, I can think of a ton. I definitely think like just transportability of parts for even I mean, especially plastic. If like, yeah, I don't know, different medical device equipment, like being able to ship more in a shipment. Uh, just because, like, the example they show is basically just growing something small into something a little bit bigger. Right. Hmm. All right, Billy, what's up next? On Tuesday, the Japan Restroom Industry Association announced that it had developed a new set of control panel illustrations for multifunctional super toilets, standardizing the system for the benefit of foreign visitors. So, under the new guidelines, future Japanese bidet toilets will use eight symbols corresponding to eight basic operations. Lid opening, closing, seat opening, closing, flushing large, flushing small, drying, and stop, including buttons to wash specific private parts as well. Huh. Well, I want then. one of these sweet toilets. <laughs> you want a bidet? <laughs> I want a bidet. Oh, man. I, okay. <laughs> I prefer a bidet. Debt. <laughs> but like all kind of joking aside though this is a really important thing to have done this is because now you're like you're really stepping into a brand new country i mean knowing how the different functions on a toilet are probably the, one of the least to your worries but still you want to know what's going on and what you should be doing right and, and symbols help bridge that language iconography iconography uh, iconography is really big especially yeah when you're traveling uh, to a foreign language and you don't and you don't know the language and especially I've done I've dealt with this in software development as well where you'll have to develop an icon that will have to be understood by everyone like let's say it's very specific I can't say exactly which project I worked on but 
let's say, uh, let's say you are working at McDonald's and Mm -hmm. not again. uh, No, this is not for McDonald's and I don't endorse McDonald's. I'm just using this as an example. Let's say you want a hamburger, uh, and you don't speak English and you see Big Mac on there. You want like a picture of it. Yeah. Something that something representative, uh, so they can see it and order it on a screen or something. Right. And that's like the difficulty of building any illustration like that. That's that universal that there's no question of what it means. Right. So I um, I intentionally didn't listen to Billy when he was saying the various functions, but for a reason. So I actually have the icons. <laughs> I actually have the icons up here right now, and I'm trying. To, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what they are. Okay. So I see. Okay. So there's eight of them. Um, and you guys can, we'll post the link on our Facebook. You guys can follow this. I think this was on Gizmodo. Uh, yeah, this was on Gizmodo. So you can follow the link there and check out these icons for yourself. But okay, I'm looking at them and I think they correspond to what's in the art or, uh, on our show notes there, Billy, let me know if I'm, if I'm heading in the right direction. So I have, it looks kind of like a big swirly here. Um, I, I'm guessing that's, I don't know, flush. (laughs) Mm-hmm. It looks like flush. Okay. And then looks like a smaller flush. Yep. Next yep, to, yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, these next ones, I'm not sure. They, like they dictionary. Oh, you know what I bet this is? I bet this is angle of the uh, stream. Uh, that's what they look like. So there's, it's, it kind of looks like a toilet with the, um, with the two sort of like the seat and the, the flap seat flap. And then it has an arrow going across the seat flap. But I'm guessing that might be a stream. I don't know. Is there anything about like adjusting streams? So, there is one about opening and closing lids and oh, seats. That's what it is. Okay, so it opens and closes the lids and seats. Uh, this next one, this next one looks like a stop button on a traditional like play. Is that is that what it is? Man, you just won the prize. Oh yeah, man. Stop. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this next one cracks me up. So this is. <laughs> oh no. So this one is a uh, sideways three. With the two little um, bumps on the three facing downwards, uh-huh. and then coming up is a dotted line that kind of looks like a spout that you would find from a little whale. Um, <laughs> so it's almost like uh, cleaning the butt. Oh, yes, the yes, yes. Okay, okay. And then this other one uh, looks like a female. Yeah. Um, icon here, a female uh, representation here with the same sort of spray. Uh, so I'm guessing. Clean the female? I don't. I yeah. don't know. Okay. All right. And then this last one kind of looks like heat. Like I, I'm not sure. Dry? You're the man. Okay. Yes. Dry. That was that was fun. <laughs> that was fun. They did a good job. Then I guess what are they? Can you read them back to me? Yeah. Sure. It's um flush large, flush small, open and close lid, open and close seat, stop, cleaning different private. I'm sorry. What was that last one you cut out there for a sec? Drying. Okay, that's good. No, they. I think. Oh, yeah, it's right underneath it. I was looking right. <laughs> um, no, no, no. <laughs> I dope. mean, in the article, the the next paragraph. I did not have the next paragraph up. I was not cheating. No, these are good. I, I think I can. I think they're really this, good. Though, this iconography. I mean, this must go into the idea of design when you guys are, especially when you're designing an interface that won't have languages on it. For sure. You, guys where it's going to be used right oh yeah yeah uh contextual um sort of use is uh is really really high on my list anyway i'm, I'm a really a big fan of that mm-hmm. i mean is this going to become a thing are we going to have kind of like a high, universal hieroglyphics at one point um i don't know if we'll ever get to that point no i think we just try and use you know symbols as much as we can the same way but i don't know if there will ever be just like a giant set of hieroglyphs that we'll always use but i mean we right. already have it a lot yeah but we already have it a lot in like entertainment we have play stop record power button on off switch you know we have all the numbers of course we have vol- vol up vol down things like that plus and minus yeah, no, there are definitely things that we can leverage um, when designing for something like that. And there are standards that have been established, but I don't, you'll never, there will always be like, what is the, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something ridiculous. Like what is the iconography for, uh, 
you know, I want to take a drink, but I can't because my dog is pulling me too fast on the leash or something. You know, like something ridiculous. Like it's a dog running away with a leash. And a guy with a drink in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of that meme with the sign of a dog on a skateboard with a bottle of beer and a cigarette. And it says, I don't know who this dog is, but I want to party with that dog. <laughs> I haven't seen that it's one. The truth of the matter. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Billy. I mean, okay, next one. Yeah, next let's, one. Go, let's go on to the next one. We're running a little here. Okay, so the U.S. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has released its full findings following the investigation into a driver's fatal use of Tesla's semi-autonomous autopilot feature. The report clears Tesla's autopilot system of any fault of the incident and highlights its impact on safety, low, lowering the overall number of traffic incidences involving Tesla vehicles. So this is cool. This goes back to one of the, well... This is this goes back to last week when we were talking about um, they just they just uh, made this new committee. Oh yeah, that's right, the automation committee that came up in the, like the last, uh, uh, and it's from the DOT, right, or Department of Transportation that's running it. Yeah, I believe so. Um, but this this is really significant because uh, basically they said no, Tesla's not at fault here. This is uh, user error, and interesting. And uh, you know what? On top of that. Automation has, uh, I think they, they attached the 40% crash rate reduction to this. So they actually said this reduces crash rates by 40% if they use autopilot correctly. Um, and now I'm not, I'm not an expert on this case, but I believe the driver was going faster than the speed limit. That's to my knowledge. I don't know. What do you, what do you think, Blake? I'm going to check on that speed limit. So claim. It- it, this was really interesting to me, and this is like a—I think it's a big win for not only Tesla, of course, because I mean they have an autopilot system. This has to do with their cars, yada yada. But it's also just big for automation in general to find out that Tesla themselves are being doing as much user testing as they do crash testing. I think that's just a really big deal, and hopefully a model that other car companies will follow, so that automation, like across the board, no matter who's making it for cars, you see this. Overall reduction, as long as the human is someone in the loop. Speaking of Tesla, a car almost crashed right outside the studio. I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, go ahead, Billy. A question about this, though. Like, <clears throat> how do they know that the driver was at fault? Because I know that at least all of us, when we drive, we do not drive the letter of of the speed limit and things like that. You know what I mean? Like, do Teslas go exactly the speed limit? So they they actually just implemented something recently that caps uh, the speed limit in their cars. They they did cap it at the actual speed limit. So like let's say the speed limit sixty five, they would right. cap it then. Uh, before there was no cap to it, so you could go autopilot at eighty, and uh, y- you could just go. Um, I think since that speed limit, uh, there was a lot of pushback, obviously because people love their speed and breaking the law. Um, yeah. I think they actually went back to now you can go five miles above the speed limit. So if the speed limit's five, your mileage may vary. You can go 70. Um, and there's a whole lot of issues with like, you know, going the speed of traffic. Like we all live here in Southern California and driving the freeway sometimes between LA and San Diego, there is periods of, of, uh, freeway where, Everyone's going 80, and if you were the one yeah. going 65, it's actually more dangerous. So, they they, right. they understand this. It's a tricky situation because you have to you have to account for all factors, and you really just you can't cap it, or and you can't. They're trying to be safer for the users, but you can't. It's not a one size fits all, which is interesting because like they're having to fight a kind of a battle of well, not everybody has autonomous cars as of today, so it makes it more difficult for them to figure out like, okay, how is this AI gonna learn why it's driving that people have a tendency to go over the speed limit or what do I do? Do I adjust it to all the traffic around me or do I buy the laws? You know, question about that future like future thing right there is I would wonder if once everybody has if it's a thing, wondering if we uh 
if we actually get places slower now because we're not speeding or going with the flow of traffic anymore. You know what I mean? I wonder if we're going to go travel slower then. Well, there's there's a whole we could we could do a whole section on this where we talk about the uh, moral issues of like let's say Billy that uh-huh. let's say that you, me, and Blake all have autopilot cars or autonomous cars and blake and i are uh we let's say let's say we're all on the road you me and blake we're all on the road and Uh let's say there's an opportunity for blake and i to get to work on time but Uh you would get there 10 minutes late Hmm. or or we all get there five minutes late so there's that issue when you come to swarm mentality because now amplify that to the entire road. What if there was one person on the road who would get to work 10 minutes late, but everybody else on the road got there on time? It's, it's, a, it's a moral dilemma, and we'll talk a little bit about autonomous moral dilemmas later. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to me. I, it's, it's something that, I mean, and how do you not piss off your users when you say, okay, you're going to be the late one today? Well, that's the thing. Like, you're <laughs> never gonna be able to please everybody through right. this kind of automation. Well, maybe you will. I don't know. It's just it's so brand new, though, that we're, some things are gonna be sacrificed for some amount of time. Or people will just have to get used to leaving five minutes earlier to get there on time. Like, how hard is it, people? Okay. Uh, so hang on, really quick. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at this case, and this was the case where uh, the Tesla Model S collided with this tractor trailer. Uh, uh-huh. They were crossing an uncontrolled intersection on a highway in florida um it doesn't florida say... man florida man oh yep here it is uh the last recorded driver action was increasing the cruise control set speed to 74 miles per hour less than two minutes prior to impact so, so the guy was hauling ass the guy was hauling ass he was yeah he was not being a safe driver oh man mm-hmm. Just drive drive the speed limit folks all right billy what's up next MIT wants to answer the trolley problem by creating a moral machine. The moral machine puts you in the shoes of a programmer that has to train a self-driving car in how to handle these uncommon scenarios. The idea here is the idea. The idea, idea here is that the car may have made the best decision based on the data available. So this is cool. This is this goes back to my prediction from last week that we will have at least one autonomous incident where it will have to decide with the trolley problem. Is anybody else noticing a pattern here? Oh, I know. Making right? Nick's dreams come true. Well, well yeah, Uber flying cars or maybe next week. He just looked all this stuff ahead of time. I did this not. Is this awful. is this week's news. That was last week. He come on. Never. Uh, no, this is cool. This is cool. So um, to remind you guys, the trolley problem is: do you? Um, if you if you can save the life of like three humans versus uh, uh, three adult humans or you know a um, uh, older adult human a child and a dog is what they have on this one. I mean there's there's a variety of different ways, but the the classic example is the trolley problem. You could either do nothing um, and have the trolley kill five people on the main track or pull the lever and uh, kill one person. Like it's it's but everyone on the trolley's injured, so it's it's a matter of like which which what's the more ethical choice, I guess, in this in this situation. Didn't we talk about this a little bit when we were talking about um, AI machines, like fighter jets and things like that, different types of AI consciousness and stuff? We may have. Um, it's definitely something that yeah, they would have to do it too. Like, do you do you avert a crash that's uh, imminent when you have like three or four fighter jets in line in formation and you know one of them fails do you kill the one pilot um or do you have it crash into all four maybe potentially save the pilot on board but then everyone will have to eject so it's like you know do you sack you... the mission or do you sack the man yeah kind of okay okay all right so this trolley problem is what you were talking about, and this moral machine is kind of like a program. Can anybody go do this or something like that? I think I think that's just a study. So I think what they're doing is um, they're basically putting people into this position, and they're saying, okay, 
are elderly people worth less than the young? Is a female <laughs> life worth less than a male's? Is you know, there's there's no right answer to these. I mean, a female's life is obviously equivalent to a male's. Let's just be clear. Uh, I'm making a political statement right here, but I mean, you know, it's these ambiguous statements that like. How do how does humanity see the answer to these? There's a lot of people who don't believe that a female's life is worth the same as a male's. And so they might answer, yeah, take the female's life versus the male's in that situation. So what they're doing at MIT is they're presenting uh, research subjects with all these positions. L let's take another, let's take an easier approach. Let's, let's think about it from animals. We all know animals as our best friends, um, as our family. But if it's somebody else's animal, you're detached from it. Now, do you save the life of a human or the save the life of an animal? Well, if it's my animal, save that animal. But if it's, you know, not my animal, then the human's life is saved. So they're having people answer these questions. And then basically the machine will crunch the numbers and say, okay, well, most humans would find this one acceptable. Which this, is an interesting approach to take because you're just basically looking at the average response and right. saying, uh, this one happens the most. We're going to get in less trouble if we do it this way. Yep. Yeah. The cat lives. Yeah. I remember this actually, this is like the age old question they always hear, you know, the myth says, would you pick me over your dog if we were both hanging off a cliff? I'd always answer with, who pushed my dog over a cliff? <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm not going to bring up some past uh, experiences. I know, I know <laughs> someone asked you that question a long time ago and I'm not going to bring it up. I doubt they're listening, but anyway. <laughs> we all got that question asked to us one point or another. See, all right. See, hang on, hang on, really quick, just to address that. I'm easy because uh, my girlfriend would just want me to to save the cats. That's that's uh that's what it comes down to. But anyway, well, any good woman would. Yeah. All right. So what's up next? A new Pentagon report suggests that the F-35 fighter jet still has hundreds of deficiencies and won't be ready for full combat testing until 2019. Oh, man. I can't even so, imagine how long it's been in production because I feel like I've heard about the F-35 for a long time. A long time, yeah. It's okay, you guys, are de you guys are designers, and I have a legit question here, okay? Sure. What you got? We have some of the most powerful machines of war in the world, right? I mean, uh, kind of. I mean, we have arguably at least comparable to the most powerful machines in the world and everything like that. You know, so our our current fighter jets are just as good as the majority of the other fighter jets in the world. This F thirty five is supposed to be super superior, but aren't we kind of like with drones and things like that? Aren't we getting away from man made vehicles like this now? I mean, what are we going to use these for? Aliens? Um, so there will always be a need for a human operator a lot of the times because, uh, well, until artificial intelligence can make decisions that humans can't. Uh, that's, that's essentially what it comes down to. Um, but, I mean, you're talking about the advanced state of this technology and why does it have so many deficiencies, right? Mm -hmm. So think about Facebook. Facebook has... A ton of deficiencies. Uh, this is news because it's a fighter jet that we're spending tax dollars on. And right. uh, the actual, let's see here, the actual article says 276 deficiencies. Now, I don't... That's kind of incredible cons okay. considering that it's an aircraft. Hold up. Hold up. Let me ask you. Okay, so we've both worked on projects where you track sort of uh, usability issues in a backlog, like uh, something that Atlassian would have, right? Like Jira. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How many? Jira? Yeah. So Jira is kind of like a ticket backlog. Uh, it's a typical software development tool that you track like issues in software or project sprints. Right. So okay. let, me, let me just ask you, Blake, on average across any project, how many issues are in the backlog? Oh, man. They're, it depends on how long the it, product's been going. Let's say it's been going there, on like a year. There's a lot there's of probably things. probably going to be like 500 plus items you could fix. Yeah, I've worked with stuff that's like in the 800s, right? And it's, I I see this as 276. Yeah, that's a that sounds like a lot. But when you really break it down, it could be something as like, oh, you know, 
the uh, fire button was misspelled. It was, you know, F R I E or something. Fry. It said fry instead of fire. You know, it's something like that the where it's like. The cup holder wasn't big enough. It could be, <laughs> yeah, right? It could be low hanging fruit. And it's just. In the a, cockpit? That's weird. You Yeah, right. Um, but, <laughs> but I mean, the, the I think the big part in this article is that this is saying that it won't be ready for combat testing. And there's got to be a really stringent set of rules that come with full combat testing readiness. Right. No, you're right. And I'm playing devil's advocate here because this this article does state that these are critical issues. Um, you know, so 276 critical issues. And it also comes back to how they define critical. Um, I'm not sure on this specific project how they do define critical. But, I mean, it's always... It, they they just need to hire more people like you and me, Blake, to to take care of this kind of thing. Yeah, put us to the left and we'll build it right. <laughs> I mean, I think I don't understand the point of this thing. Like, what's the point of this fighter jet? Um, you're asking political questions that I don't think we should address. Oh, on you're the show. right. I'm sorry. You're right. I'm right. Oh, you're well, sorry. If if you want to just like go at a high level, I mean, it's at some point upgrades to old aircraft just have to be made. But I think what you're referring to with like why why are we do, still doing this if we're moving in the UAS direction? And I think there's just yeah. a large limiting factor on what UAS can do. And sorry, UAS old unmanned. Aerial systems. Yeah. yeah no, I can't UAVs, talk. Uh, yeah, all that stuff. Um, just a side note, Donald Trump is uh, lashing out against the F-35 program. Political views well, aside? That's kind of interesting. That's just an interesting thing. Because that is a lot of money being tossed into an aircraft. He says the cost is out of control and billions of dollars can and will be saved on military and other purchases after January 20th. Well, wow. here we are. Well, that's yeah, that's true. All right, let's talk about politics. What's up next, Billy? According to a new study published this week in the Journal of Nature Communications, researchers have devised a way to reprogram bacterial cells to recognize electronic signals. The system could one day allow our smartphones or other devices to communicate directly with cells in our bodies. This sounds like some Gattaca-level crap right here, man. This is cool. Nano machines. I feel like I say this is cool after every article. I'm gonna let you handle this one, Blake. So this one was really interesting to me because in the article they they literally talk about making a bacterial cell like change colors like it was an on off switch, like make it glow a bright bright fluorescent green. Now, granted, this is one piece of bacteria, but th- that's insane. You're basically changing the makeup so that during protein synthesis, this thing is glowing. Yeah, it reminds me of that story we talked about last week, I Boy. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't check it out. I, 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 I'm not going to check that no, out. No, I didn't either. I totally <laughs> forgot about it after we did it. Maybe right. I'll remember tonight. Probably not. I don't know. This would be cool, though. I, I think, uh, yeah. Have, I mean, this is this is one step closer to that uh, holy grail of human brain interface. Well, that's that was the interesting part because this is all being done like through just electronic signals, and that your brain is just a giant set of neurons firing all the time. It's nothing but electronic. So signal, you're yeah. you're true. You're sorry. You're right. I mean, we're getting closer to having just technology so integrated with even our own physiology. It's a question so, about this, guys, sure. real quick. Um, I might sound a little bit alarmist here, but. If we start putting things that can do things by via smartphone to us and like, you know, uh, regulate functions or illnesses in our body based on like app, doesn't this get to the point where people might start hacking our bodies? Yeah, that's a real concern. That is a real concern. But if you I'll like raise a devil advocates point for you. And this I alluded a little bit to this in the last um, episode, too. But think about, like, the hive mind concept. Now, of course, you can always get back to, well, then people are just going to start figuring out ways to shield their own thoughts. But if we're integrating just technology so seamlessly with our own physiology and we're able to communicate with each other in that kind of seamless fashion across electronics, it'd be hard to mask your own thoughts. It would kill the podcast industry because... We wouldn't have to develop a podcast. Everyone would already know what we're thinking. We'd be thinking it to them. Right, exactly. Thinking to you live from Human Factors (laughs) Cast. It is Human Factors Thought Broadcast. I don't know. Number 27. All right. What's up next, Billy? Okay, so uh, according to new research, one in five young people regularly wake up in the night to send or check messages on social media. What? This nighttime activity is making teenagers three times more likely 
to feel constantly tired at school than their peers who do not log on at night and could be affecting their happiness and well-being. Really? That's a thing? Oh, I mean, man. Social media is destroying our youth? <laughs> okay, though. They were right? Maybe, but I, I don't know. I have a hard time with this a little bit. What's your hard time? Because is it... Okay. So is it the fact that they're getting on and checking social media or is it the blue light they're looking at in the middle of the night that's keeping them awake? It could be both. But there's a reason <laughs> There's a reason that they're going to that blue light in the first place. Yes, because it's a dopamine response. Right. I, I feel validated when I post my thing and somebody likes it. Yes. There's this whole or, social or, psychology with social media. That, uh, or when I tell a random stranger to go kill themselves for some stupid reason. You're one of those guys. You're a troll. You're an internet troll. I'm not one of those guys. I'm unfollowing you on Twitter. Yeah. Unfollow Comstar says, Cleric. No, I'm... I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead and follow him. He's a great he's a great thing. I imagine that Entity. one of these days that we're going Entity to have like a snap back <laughs> where people are going to say, you know, we're going to go low tech, we're going to disconnect, we're going to get away from our phones. I think we're going to have that snapback here, either the next generation or, or, or soon after, you know? Yeah, maybe. Who knows? I certainly see it. I mean, in my own life, I want to like at least take breaks, I like see long s- periods of time with no technology. I see some millennials even trying to break away from, um, from technology, and, and they want to be off in their own... Kind of yeah, talking, wasn't we, it the other day that, like, a lot of people don't use Facebook anymore? I mean, like... Nope. I, I know I don't. I, I, I actually mean, don't have one anymore, yeah. But I, I don't... I still think there's a large enough audience for all of them. Oh, just just a quick side note about not using social media anymore. It's, like, it's so hard to use the social media for our Human Factors cast stuff. Like, I feel like I need to hire a young person to like hop on there and just post something every day to drive engagement. But uh, hopefully you guys all understand, um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're working as hard <laughs> as we can to provide you guys with content. Do so, it our best. Do it, do it our best. All right. All right. I think, I think we've, uh, that's like kind of a duh question, a duh thing, but uh, what's up next? Let's talk a little bit about design. Okay. So this one I'm actually kind of excited about because it goes back to what I was talking about the other day. Uh, well, sort of, kind of, Half-Life 3. But in other words, uh, oh, yeah. Valve's Gabe Newell hosted an AMA, an Ask Me Anything session on Reddit this week, where he discussed design and what approach people should take if they want to get into the game design business. Gabe states, the most important thing you can do is to get in Gabe, the whoa, impact whoa. of your work. Hey, Gabe. Have a high... Gabe, you cut out there. Can you can you reread that, Gabe? Not a problem there, Nick. I love your podcast. I hope he listens oh. to this. <laughs> Gabe, Gabe Newell <laughs> listens to Human Factors Cast. Gabe Newell here saying the most important thing you can do is to get into an iteration cycle where you can measure the impact of your work, have a hypothesis about how making changes will affect and ship change regularly. And to that I say... Confirmation of Half Life Three. Uh, I don't know if it's quite there, but he does discuss the uh, he does discuss the iteration process, and that's that's a huge one for us in uh, Human Factors field. I mean, like we are always always iterating upon our designs. And I mean, that's what really you- big in the zeitgeist now for just software development, right? Like, I mean, Google Ventures itself has put out like a I don't know a really big hit book called Sprint, where they try and go through this in product development within very short spans of time, like five to seven days, uh, just continually do this loop. Yeah, there's some really cool um, videos online of companies doing these design challenges where they'll basically, yeah, they, they'll have only a couple days to uh, redesign a product or something, you know, and they'll they'll post it as as a uh, video. Um, I've actually... My company- Oh, go my ahead. company does this. I'm sorry. My company does the same thing. Every every year they have a kind of like a hackathon where they take new ideas or old ideas put on the wayside and kind of reimagine them or redevelop them for different uses. And then the company might put them on the production slate for later on. You know. Yeah, I actually was a was a part of one of these hackathons at uh, one of the HFES section or sessions um, two years ago, I think. And uh, no, it was really cool. We had like basically an hour to design a web app for sharing scientific studies. 
Um, but yeah, no, I, I think I think Gabe really, uh, and thank thank you, Gabe, for being on the show. Um, Not a problem, Nick. Oh my God, is he Santa Claus? What is it? <laughs> ho ho ho! I bring <laughs> steam sales four times a year. <laughs> oh my gosh! All right, all right. Let's let's finish this up. What's the last piece of news we got? Um. Uh, okay. So help me out on this one. Is it Ookla or Okla? Ookla. Ookla. The guys behind speedtest.net released a breakdown of the best and worst free airport Wi-Fi. The top three for download speeds were Denver, Philadelphia, and SeaTac or Seattle Tacoma. Have you guys been to any of these airports? I've been to Denver. Oh yeah, you and me both. I got stuck. Uh, yeah, Denver. <laughs> I got stuck in uh, SeaTac for twenty four hours. Uh, really? Four hours in SeaTac. Due to delayed flights. Yeah, it was awful. Um <laughs> But their Wi-Fi was great. I will I have always, to say that. Okay, is it really a fear? Should I be afraid of using public Wi-Fi like this? Uh, well, if That's you know, if my predictions are any indication, we're gonna have some major cyber attack this year. So, yes. Okay. Cool. 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 I mean, I have so a pretty good, just... pretty good track record so far. I mean, <laughs> so I should just fours. take my Galaxy Note Six and just leave it at home now. <laughs> is that the one that blows up? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Do do leave it at home. For sure. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So that's it for Human Factors News this week. Let's take a minute to catch up with our listeners. Hey, listeners. We want to hear from you. Uh, if something we say on the show resonates with you, let us know. We'll read your story on the show. Today, we're hearing from Jason. Now, Jason writes, Nick and gang, I appreciate the new format as I'm always trying to find Human Factors related news sources, but something you said on last week's episode rubbed me the wrong way, and I thought I'd email you my two cents. Well, thanks for writing in, Jason. That's got to be it for today. I'm just kidding. All right. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just kidding, Jason. All right. So Jason writes, uh, also, regarding the Nintendo Switch, you labeled it as an ergonomic nightmare, although I would beg to differ on the design of the controller. Think about how you normally hold a controller. Okay, I'm thinking, guys. I'm picturing. I'm, I'm picturing. Okay, it. I'm holding it in my hands in front of me. He um, has it in his hands. Yep, I got the whole world there. Uh, and how Good. my okay, and he also says, and how your body contorts to accommodate the shape of any other controller. Uh, so he says, i.e., shoulders in, hands close together. Okay, so I'm holding it. My shoulders are in. My hands are close together. He says, okay. this, the switch allows players to hold on, hold one in each hand. Similar to what the Wii did with the Wiimote and the Nunchuck, although in this instance, there is no wire between them. Uh, Jason argues that this allows the user to play their games in the most comfortable way they see fit. Uh, He also says, while I agree with your assessment regarding the limitless combinations the Switch offers, it may make up for it in its versatility. Let me know what you guys think. Well, thanks for writing in, Jason. Uh, That's a wonderful point. Something that I really didn't even consider um, I'm just looking at this as like a million piece puzzle that you have to put together every time you want to play. Wow, that was a lot of alliteration. Yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> a million I piece puzzle lie. you want to put together every time you want to play? Yep, nailed it. Nice. I mean, I think it's a good point because, I mean, even me loving the Xbox controller so much, he's right from the postural standpoint, you are just contorting yourself and like yeah. screwing your shoulders up all over the place. But that this only really works in the Switch's um, case when you have it set up so that it is separate when you're not like actually using it as a Whoa, controller <laughs> controller in your hands and you've actually got it separated so you can move them across. So it's, well, a, it's I, a good point. Yeah, but I mean, it's not the only thing you brought up, Nick. You also brought the idea. Oh, no, we I lost Gabe. One hand. How? Huh? I said, oh, no, we lost Gabe. Go ahead. Uh, could you repeat that? <laughs> we lost you for a sec there. No problem. Uh, you were talking about how holding one of the Joy-Cons in your hand might cramp up your hand because it's so small with a single-use one. Yeah. You know what I mean? But across two of them. So I think what Jason's saying here is that you can hold one in each hand while you're playing a game instead of having it in the controller classic controller configuration that you would normally see. Um, so, so yeah, when, when you're – yeah, I, I do remember saying that where you have one of these Joy-Cons is what they're calling them, which is half of a controller – um, mm-hmm. when you have that half in your hand, yeah, it's really tiny and you would have to hold it like an old school controller. Um, but yeah, and your camera like, cramp up that way. Hold on. Blake, re- wants, yeah. Blake wants to rewind. Let's rewind one time. They call it a Joy-Con? They call it a Joy-Con. Oh, that's hilarious. And funny enough, after, after our show last week, I researched it a little bit more and apparently it's got like 
it, it, they're they're trying to sell games on this thing to where there's no like screen interface. It's like you can play rock paper scissors with this thing and it can sense what what you know rock paper or scissors that you're doing. You just hold it up to your hand. It like how you contoured your hand and just picks it up. Yeah, that's I awesome. Know, that's weird. I don't, I don't know. But we will still try to. We're still in the process of trying to get Nintendo to give us what. It's uh, common. Who knows after last I mean, week, though? Let and, them put their money where their mouth is. If they think these are good controllers, send it to Human Factors, cats, and we will be and critical about it. Yeah, I, I, I want, I want this to be good. I want this to be yeah. good. I just, and who knows? I haven't played around with this yet, and it might just be, you know, oh Nick, you're being too hard on it, like. It, it, like, will I accept this as a fact of life that I'll just have to, you know, move 17 different parts if I want to play Legend of Zelda or something? Like, I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, Jason, thank you so much for writing in. Let's switch gears a bit and play a game. I got a game for you guys. Oh, goodness. I know. Billy, gonna... are you ready for this? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Perfect response. Let's do it. This is, uh, we're going to play Human Factors 20 Questions. This is a game where you guys, Blake and Billy, are going to have to guess a Human Factors person, place, thing, or concept in 20 questions or less oh, goodness. by only asking yes or no questions. Um, we sourced this week's topic from one of our colleagues, but going forward, we want to hear from you guys. So send us suggestions. You can do that by sending your suggestions at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. All right, guys, for this, I want you to think aloud. We're going to do the think aloud protocol so everyone knows what's on your mind. Your goal is to try to get me to do some facial expression that gives you a hint. Like I said, this is a person, place, thing, or concept sourced from one of our colleagues. Okay, go. For one of okay, our let's, colleagues? Uh, let's narrow yes. it down a little bit first there, Blake. Yeah, let's go and narrow it down. Do we want to ask if it's uh, if it is one of those things, person, place? Well, we have to ask yes or no questions. So first oh, thing, I would awful. think, Blake, you do... Do the initial questions. Oh, okay. I think you should ask him if it's a person. No pressure. Okay. So is it a person, Nick? No. Okay. okay. So it... it all right. Uh, so, okay. Is it a theory? Concept. Go concept. Is it a concept? Mm, yes. Okay. Concept. Mm, he's not sure about that. Uh... Mm. That's a tough one. It's a yes. I would I would classify it as a concept. Uh, if if we're using those, I, I, mm, I can't answer that. Okay. I, you don't you don't that doesn't count against you. Okay. Okay. What else we got, uh, Billy? So we we know it's not a person. It is kind of a concept, but not really. Uh, it's a is it a? I mean, like, is it a physical thing? No. I, he's answering the questions. Who's answering? He's asking the questions. Oh, oh, oh okay. Well, it, I, I think you should ask the questions, too, because I get nervous in front of Nick. Uh, is it a... All right. You guys got to let this tension go between you. Does two. it have to do specifically with psychology? Oh, um, I mean... Uh, mm, no. Have we done a show about it? No. Oh. Okay, so we haven't done a I'm show about that. it. This is from one of our colleagues. I, I want to say this is from Shannon. Um, but it's not Fast psychology based. It's from Shannon. <laughs> the <laughs> listeners will love that one. <laughs> this from Shannon? Uh, yeah, that will help <laughs> really well. Okay, is it related to design? Yes, and that's five. Okay, that's five, Billy. And we That's have five. We know that okay, it's so it's a design theory concept thing that's not asked by um <laughs> uh, we're really narrowing it down here. Uh, okay. Is it ask him if it's about Max? Oh, do you want to waste a question on that? Oh, is it? Okay, so there's okay, is it all right, I think I have an idea. Is it a specific me methodology? No, that's a great question. Methodology. So, it might I'm, warm. I'm, um, is it bigger than a bread box? <laughs> okay. So, all right. So, it kind of has to do with design. It's not a methodology. It's not specifically a like a broad concept, but we can't rule that out. And it's not a it's not a concept or a theory that we've covered on the show. Okay. So. And it's it's from one of our colleagues. This is really hard. It could be anything. So is, I mean, that's the problem. It's like there's it, this you got to narrow it down. Yeah. Is there a famous 
scientist that is notably tied to this thing? I can't answer that question. That's a freebie. Freebie. I can't yeah, answer because that question. That's you can't not yes or no answer, that no. one? I can't. I don't know. Oh, burn. Okay. Uh, and I, I can't Google uh, it because you're sitting right here. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can't. That's right. Okay, so we can't link it to a specific person. That makes it even harder because I was thinking I, we could narrow it I down. I don't think so. I, is it? Hang on. Keep, keep talking out loud. I'm going to... Uh, He's gonna try to angle this thing so he can hide it from me. Um, okay, so design. What are we talking about here? All right. Does it? Okay, so we. As far as design, are we talking like user experience specific? Not. No. <laughs> I almost gave you more details than I needed to. No. Not specifically. Okay, so it's not user experience uh, specific. See, this is the problem. I. I don't know what to ask. I know this is this is really tough for me, and I you know do this for a life living. Yeah, you know, uh, a lifing. What you uh, got? Nick? Okay, um, so let's see. Hold, hold up, on, hold, hold up, up, really hold quick, really is, quick. Is it a... really quick in response to if there's a person attached to it? Yeah, I mean there are always is a person, but I don't recognize their name. So okay. that's, that's, that works. Uh, that works. So I'm I'm still oh. gonna give that a freebie to you guys. That's fine. Okay. Oh. Okay, no, we did a top. We didn't do a topic on the show with it. It's okay. I have I have an idea here. Is okay. Is this design thing typically seen in a specific domain? Yes. Is that domain the military? No. Is the domain training dolphins? Uh, all right, so it's not the military, but... Is that a serious question? No, it's no, okay. a serious question. <laughs> it should be, but it's not. Uh, okay, so how many questions? What are we looking at? How yeah. many questions Ooh, I got left? We're at eight, so you have, what, 12 left? Oh, 10,000 questions Okay, left. hold on real quick, real quick. What you got? Uh, ask them if it has, if it's about human interaction. Like, person to person. Ooh, that's really good. Person to person interaction. Because say, if not, then it's person to machine interaction that might limit something. Say no, it's not person to person interaction. Is it nine. person to machine interaction? Yes. First, okay. It's, okay. Uh, Don't you do that. Hold on. Specify. So are you asking, is it person to machine interaction as like that's the concept that Oh yeah, I see what you're saying. No. Or is it or Does is it, it have is it literally a does it have to do with the design of the interaction between a person and a machine? Yes. Yes, that's 10. Okay. Okay, that's 10. So, all right, let's recap a little bit. There's not much to recap, but it's a design thing. I want to say concept, but that's probably the wrong word. It's a design concept that has to do with the designing for the interaction of a human and a machine, but it's, and it's not specific to the military, but it is from a specific domain. Okay. And it has nothing to do with automation. It has nothing to do with uh, necessarily the the bricks of design or heuristics of human. It has nothing to do with any of the show topics we've talked about. Okay, so this would have nothing to do with video game design then. Right, nope. So let's pull that away. Um, what else do we have? Uh, All right, let's think. Let's think of another field that we really haven't dove into and talk about. That's probably the best way we can go here. So, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, we know it's not proprietary to the military. Yeah, it's not proprietary to the military. Does it have to do with transportation? Ooh, he's thinking. I can't answer that question. Probably not. I'll give that to you for free. Oh. Okay. Uh, uh, doesn't have to do with transportation, but it still is a human machine interface or design of a human machine interface. Like, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to give you any more clarification, but I, I it gave be, you a freebie. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's uh, use majority on a phone. Mm, no. Okay, so it's not mobile necessarily. Okay, so it's not mobile necessarily, but is it okay? Is this thing? Gracious. Let me just remind you to be careful with how you ask questions. Yeah, it's not ominous at all. I totally uh -huh. understand that very well. 
<laughs> I, I, okay, so is this have anything that does to, to do with design of applic web applications? I feel like a lot of these should just be a hard yes or no. I know. Well, it's it, it's interesting because, like I said, this is sourced from one of our colleagues, and so I'm not super familiar with the topic. And oh, good. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. That's, that works. I'm Got familiar. I'm familiar enough to answer these questions. Your question again was: Is this specific to web applications? Web applications. It can be no, specific to no. Specific to no. Okay, but you're saying it can be. Yeah, you're asking if it's specific to. And I gave you so I gave you the hint. So it you're can be. telling me it can be applied to web application design without right. telling me that. I'm 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 gonna give you guys a quick little tip. You're you're limiting yourself when you say specific Secret. to. Yeah, that's that's probably you true. might you might want to angle it related to. You know, he couldn't make yeah. it easy and just like tell us a do like Jacob Nielsen, you know, and we yeah, had to guess who it was. This is just, <laughs> he picked like from probably the most obscure thing possible. Is it related yeah. to the Internet of Things? No. Ah, no, it. it is not. All right. The Internet of Things. Yeah, we're getting nowhere. Oh, really. uh, nowhere how about this? Fast. How about um, would a man use this more? Would a man use this more than a woman? No. Would a woman use this more than a man? No. So it's probably user agnostic. You have four questions left. Four questions on the clock, ladies and gentlemen. Make them count. Oh, goodness. See, I'm doing this like typical 20 questions. Well, you're probably doing it the right way because I can't figure this out. Um, Okay. Uh... So we, we can't get that it's a concept or a theory, but we know it has to do with design. It's outside of the military. Uh, it might be able to be applied to how you design web applications, but that's not the limiting factor. Um, but it's not a specific... Does this have to do with user testing at all? No. Three questions. Have to do with what? I said user testing. Um, trying to see if it was data-driven. New rule for this game, we have to do things that actually we've talked about before. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is probably not helpful. That's, that's true. Uh, yeah, okay. This is going, way out of the sandbox. Going forward, yeah, we, we might we might do that. <laughs> we have to do things based on things we've talked about. Or tangentially related that you would know, yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Um, All right, Billy, you got me a question because I'm, I'm Oh, God, I'm trying. I'm trying here. Um, I can't remember if you told me yes or no to the design methodology. And I don't want to ask it again. Um, I said no okay, to methodology. So it's not a method. But it has uh, to do with okay. designing human and machine interfaces okay. that you could it, apply. Uh, does... God, I want to say, does, like, Facebook use this thing? Yeah, let's go with that. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so is it... Oh, goodness. We have two questions left, don't we? Yeah. Yes, you do. And Facebook uses this. It's something to do with design between human and machine. Uh, uh, is it an algorithm? I want to ask if it's an algorithm. But that doesn't help, does it? I don't know. Why not? Let's do it. All right. Is it an algorithm? Nope. Okay. So it's not right. about like finding friends or designing on how to connect things. This is your last question. You have to make a guess. Is it just your based interaction? No, we have to make a guess on this one. Yeah, you have to you have to make a guess for what it is on this one. Just your based is interaction. It, is it a That's all I got. <laughs> Talk talk through everything you know before you say gesture based interaction. I just want to make sure you guys cover all your bases. So what do you think, Billy? 
Actually, I kind of like gesture base. Well, let's let's use gesture base. Let's look at what we've talked about in gesture base. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on a second. That doesn't even work because it, this is Facebook that is employing this, right? I don't think they. Well, uh, they facial do, recognition. They do in like mobile design, which you could say it's web app design. Goodness uh, gracious, it, I don't it know. Be, it couldn't be facial recognition because the military uses that really heavily. No, well, hold on a second. That, um, I don't know. Because what Nick did say, I said, is it only specific to the military, which is what you were trying to allude to me saying it's specific yeah. to, but it's broad-based, mm. so it could be used, but it's not specific to them. Does that make so sense? So it could, because it's not person-to-person, person, it's person-to-machine, it could be like facial recognition. Sure. Is that your final guess? Do it, Blake. Pull the trigger on this. Final answer. So facial recognition. Let me let me read the description for you and see if you can come up with it. A brief, distinctive sound used to represent a specific event or convey other information. Oh, I know who you got this from now. Uh, what is that called? Uh, Earcons yeah. are a common feature of computer operating systems and applications, ranging from beeping when an error occurs to the customizable sound schemes of Windows 7 that indicate startup, shutdown, as well as many other events. Like in Facebook, when you receive a message. Awful. Awful. Earcons. Uh, Earcons. Yeah, that would have been really tough. Yeah. We would have had that. We, I would have had that take a much different approach well well well, i mean that's why we need our listeners to write in and let us know what you think would be an appropriate human factors 20 (laughs) question please help 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 blake and billy out this is this is way too hard on them um that's it for today if you have any suggestions for games to topics or news stories that you want us to cover you can follow us on social media we're on uh, the human factors cast facebook site Comment on our SoundCloud, reach us at Human Fact- H Factors Podcast on Twitter, or you can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. You can also, this one's a fun one, we haven't had anybody hit us up yet, leave us a voicemail at 901 646 1432. That's 901 646 1HFC. You can support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash human factors cast. Like, review, subscribe, iTunes, Google Play Store, we're all over the place. I want to thank the panel for being on the show today. Blake Arnsdorf, where can our listeners find you? You can find me on the internet, specifically Twitter at UX Chill Bro. Billy Hall, where can they find you? You can find me on YouTube or Twitter at Comstar Cleric. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me stumping these guys on LinkedIn or Twitter <laughs> at Nick underscore Rome. Burn. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends.